welcome everyone to the um, Columban Center for Advocacy and Outreach's first webinar of the new year. Uh, we're very excited to talk to you a day about constituent power, why advocacy is for everyone, which is a topic that is really close um, to our hearts here at the center and really important to the work that we do. Um, I'm really grateful to have three of my colleagues who will be sharing their expertise with us tonight about the different dimensions of um, meeting with your elected officials uh, as a constituent. So I just want to lay the groundwork a little bit in terms of like what we're going to talk about and then some housekeeping and then we will jump right in. Um, so first housekeeping, we are recording this webinar and it will be emailed to all those who signed up for it this tonight. So you will receive a copy of it, which will include the PowerPoints that our presenters will be sharing. Um, there is a chat, a Q&A box that you can use to ask our panelists questions. We'll have a Q&A portion once all of our panelists have presented, and we will do that for as many questions as there are. Um, and I think that is it. So why don't we get going? So the reason we wanted to start off the new year with this webinar on constituent um, advocacy and meeting with your elected officials is because at the Columban Center uh, here in Washington, DC, we think that this is an important, um, if not one of the most crucial aspects of um, implementing Catholic social teaching in your community and trying to advocate for just policies. Um, building a relationship with your member of Congress is one of the most important things that you can do as an advocate for whatever issue it is you're working on. Um, just as an example, uh, a 2015 study um, from the Congressional Management Foundation found that 79% of congressional staffers said that they would like a personal story from their constituent related to a bill or issue. They said that this would make their work um, easier and would be helpful to what they do here in Washington, D.C., but only 18% of those Staffords surveyed said that they actually received that information. So this webinar is about um, helping give you the tools to close that gap, to bring the personal stories, the experience of our communities, both near and far, and our perspective as people of faith to members of Congress. So we have three folks today who are going to kind of unpack that and explore this issue with us. And I will um, let them kind of give a more in-depth introduction to who they are. But we're going to be starting off first with Rebecca Eastwood, who is the Advocacy Campaign Manager for the ACLU of Iowa. And I will just say a former Advocacy Coordinator for our center. So we're glad to have her back. She will be followed by James Truby, who is the Justice and Peace Education Worker for the Missionary Society of St. Columban in the United Kingdom. And he'll be talking to us about sort of the spiritual, uh, how our faith calls us to do this work. And then we'll wrap up the presentation side of things with Cynthia Gonzalez, the advocacy coordinator for our office, who will be walking through the nitty gritty of how to schedule a meeting with your member of Congress, how to have an effective meeting, sort of all the things that you need to do to be as prepared as possible. So without further ado, I will kick it over to Becca um, and, and just kind of as a question to get us going, wondering if you can just share kind of, you've done a lot of visits with members of Congress for years now. So I'm curious, you know, what is your take on um, the importance of meeting with a member of Congress? But then also I think it can be a very intimidating process to meet with your member. So how can we make that easier for people. Thanks, Wesley. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, glad to be with you today on this webinar. Um, like Wesley said, my name is Becca Eastwood. I am coming to you today from the great state of Iowa in the Midwest. Um, but I previously lived and worked in Washington, D.C. Um, with the Columban Center, so I'm fortunate to be a product of the Columban world, um, and I now work on state-level policy here in Iowa with the American Civil Liberties Union. And um, I 
when thinking about what I wanted to talk about in this webinar, um, really, as Wesley said, um, my work has been has revolved around meeting with members of Congress for many years now. And um, I remember when I first started doing this kind of work and how nervous I was to speak up in meetings with members of Congress to, um, you know, bring the information and the ask that I, what I wanted them to do um, in those meetings and how um, that nerves, that nervousness never really goes away. Um, but what I have now are tools that help me um, overcome that um, place of, I want my member of Congress to have this information or to know that this is going on, or I want them to do X thing or not do X thing. Um, I now have the tools that help me get beyond that place of um, you know, I have information that I want my member of Congress to know, but I'm really nervous about reaching out to them and trying to schedule a meeting or um, even call them um, or email them, contact them generally. And so um, a couple of things that I wanted to talk about first, um, Wesley mentioned the importance of doing this work. Um, one of the the meetings with a member of Congress that stands out for me the most um, in the years that I've been doing this work is actually one that um, I had, uh, it was myself and a Colombian father from Pakistan who works in Pakistan, um, who was visiting the US at the time. And um, we met with some members of Congress who were on a specific committee, um, that was the Foreign Relations Committee. And we had information we wanted to share with them and a certain perspective we wanted to share. Um, and it so happened that later that day, um, they or later that week, the Foreign Relations Committee was having a hearing um, regarding Pakistan and US policy in Pakistan. And so um, by meeting with our member of Congress in that way, um, we were able to bring that on the ground information from that Columban father um, to this member of Congress who then used that information um, to ask questions and bring up certain topics at that hearing. Um, so that's one example that really stands out for me as a way that um, meeting with that member of Congress led to a conversation happening and issues being raised that we wanted to be raised. Um, so just one example of how meeting with your member of Congress can be super important um, in raising those issues. In terms of what helps me, the tools that help me sort of get over those nerves or um, really be able to reach out to my member of Congress um, with some level of confidence now. Um, one is having a guide map. Um, no matter what issue I'm talking about, no matter um, you know, what, what I want to say to them, having that guide map for, um, how to say it has been super helpful for me. So, you know, essentially, um, when you boil it down, all it is, is who am I? Why, am, what am I here to talk about today? Why do I care about it? Why should they care about it? And what do I want them to do? As long as I have those five components, I can apply that to any issue that I'm bringing to a member of Congress. And that has really helped me um, be able to make it concrete um, and have that tool. Um, and then the second piece that really helped me is knowing something about my member of Congress, knowing something about the person I'm going into that meeting with and being able to connect with them, um, whether it's, you know, knowing what faith tradition they come from um, and uh, or whether it's um, knowing that they wrote um, an op-ed in the local paper on some issue and I can say you know thank you for um, raising that issue. Knowing something about them has always helped me make a connection and having that connection um, typically makes it much easier and makes them much more willing to listen to what you have to say and what your ask is for them. So those two components have really helped me um, in my work um, 
be able to reach out to members of Congress um, and bring whatever message I have for them um, to them in that way. Um, some pro tips that super briefly, some pro tips that I've learned along the way. Um, one is follow up to whatever meeting you have with them, follow up with them, um, email, call, whatever, um, make sure that that's not the last time that they hear from you. And then two is don't go it alone. Go with other people. Meeting with your member of Congress, always better if you're going with other people. Um, so I would say those pro tips um, I have learned always make it more successful and make it more enjoyable. So with that, I will hand it back to you, Wesley. Um, and I hope that that's helpful for folks on the webinar as you are setting up your own meetings with your members of Congress. Thank you, Becca. I always appreciate your perspective as someone who has just been doing this work for a really long time. Um, and I think your point about follow-up is really important for what we're talking about today, because um, what we are talking about today is not like a one and done deal. Like we're, it's about building that relationship, having a relationship with your member of Congress, building that up over time. Um, and so one meeting, um, or a meeting is always the beginning of something that has touch, touch points further down the road, whether it's an email or attending their town hall or you know whatever opportunities arise. Um, and we're gonna go into a lot more detail onto pro tips and like nitty gritty, how to be super effective at this work um, when Cynthia gives her presentation. But I want to hand it over to James now, just to talk a little bit about why our faith calls us to do this and why we should not like we should not be leaving faith at the door when we are meeting with our members of Congress how it's actually a really important asset for the work that we are doing so over to you James hey, hello um, I hope you can all understand my accent I'm, I'm very nervous about speaking across the Atlantic like this but uh, here I am with you um, my name's James greetings from the UK. I work for the Columbians here as their justice and peace education worker. Um, normally my work is, is not like this. Normally my work is with uh, young people and with educators, helping them explore the relationship between faith and action. And I, I often say I'm very privileged to have this job. I absolutely love my job. I get to do all sorts of exciting things. So recent kind of programs, there was a big thing around the season of creation. So the first two weeks of September, we had lots of action building up eventually towards the uh, the COP in Glasgow. Um, another one recently was we took a group of what, what we call head teachers, and I think you call principals, trying to translate for you. Um, I'm going to use the word neighbor lots later. Um, I'm going to try and remember to take out the you in my head as I say it. Um, yeah, so so with, with all these, these um, head teachers, and we took head teachers and refugees, and we went on a holiday together. And we called it a festival of encounter. So it was a chance to kind of cross boundaries, to reflect, to think about how we welcome the stranger or how we fail to welcome the stranger, explore Catholic social teaching around it, but also how can we uh, how can we bring that practice into schools? So working for the Columbians is a privilege and a challenge. The, these are women and men ordained and lay who live out gospel values. Um, so originally they were formed for the conversion of China. Uh, they, they very quickly got kicked out of there. And they found themselves in all sorts of different countries. And in many of these countries, they found people facing oppression. OK, so they were they were in uh, Chile under Pinochet. They were in the Philippines, with Marcos. Uh, they were in situations where where they were accompanying people who were oppressed, who were having their power taken from them, who were who were in poverty, all sorts of things. So so they, they evolved this this very deep commitment to justice and peace. And over time, what's developed further is, is a, a, a kind of commitment to a solidarity with the cry of the earth. As they, they accompany people, for example, in the Philippines, indigenous communities that were being um, adversely affected by, by mining companies, they, they found this, this importance of care for creation. So we often talk about justice, peace, care for creation, ecology. Um, and with that, they've got this mission resume, yeah? So there's, there's crossing boundaries for, the, for gospel joy. Okay, so that set of values. 
and I've, I've had the privilege of meeting them and in my work I have the privilege of of bringing their stories to young people or bringing their stories to educators. So often we used Zoom. I used Zoom before it was fashionable. Um, we, we were using Zoom and, and Skype. Does anyone remember Skype? Um, to try and link people. So I, I would interview a missionary priest in Pakistan with a group of kids in, in a, a school in Birmingham in the UK. And the, the kids couldn't understand his accent. One of them said to him, um, how often do you pray? And he couldn't understand their accent. And they, he said, oh, hardly ever. Because he thought they asked, how often do you cry? And then he told this, this story about when he last cried. So th this idea of linking and, and bringing their stories in. So th there are so many stories. So um, I suppose one, one that I will share with you on our honeymoon, my wife and I, we were lucky enough to go to the Philippines um, and we, we stayed with Father Brian Gore. Brian Gore is a legend. He, he was uh, working with the poor, the oppressed um, in the time of dictatorship and he was falsely arrested and imprisoned along with a load of his catechists and another, another Columban. Um, and there he was in prison and eventually thanks to the thanks to the media in the States, in Ireland, in Britain, he was released. And here's where it gets interesting. He then refused to leave the prison in solidarity with those other ones who were also innocent and were still in the prison but didn't have this this kind of media presence until they were also released so when i get to work with people like that when i when i it, it's so hard to not be inspired be challenged and want to walk the talk with them um, a recent one at the moment that so there's here in the uk we have Columbans working um, with a destitute asylum seekers, so people trying to find safety here. You've got people on your own border over there in Ciudad Juarez and uh, in El Paso. There's all sorts of interesting things, but the one I wanted to just share is a, a beautiful, joyful video. Uh, it's a lay missionary, um, a Columban lay missionary in Korea, and she is the coordinator of their Laudato Si movement, or the, as, as it was known, Global Catholic Climate Movement. And her way of raising awareness about climate change, I thought, I thought would bring some joy to this. So, uh, Wesley, would you mind uh, sharing that video, please? We won't watch the whole thing, we'll give you a taste. <laughs> I'd like to continue, we should probably stop it there. There again? We'll stop it there, as much okay. as I would like to, to imagine the Americans all dancing to that. But the, 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 the joy, the, the, the commitment to mission, to justice and peace around the world in the Clemens, I, I hope you will agree is inspiring. And, and the, the energy and the creativity that we've just seen there is just one of many examples. So my brief for this call was to bring in the spiritual and the moral dimension of why people of faith should meet with their representatives. I suspect if you have tuned into this or you're watching it later that you already know some of this stuff. So thank you for your interest. Thank you for your willingness to be here and to explore it. And, and I hope I share something which, which takes you a little bit further. So we know that faith calls us to action. We know, we know that, we find it in scripture, we find it in Catholic social teaching, we find it in the lives of holy men and women, in the words of Pope Francis, and so on and so on. In Jesus' incarnation, we find the ultimate call to solidarity. Born in a country occupied by a foreign power, as a baby forced to flee across borders to find safety from persecution, teaching and witnessing his very life uh, to a countercultural norm-defying relational 
kin kin kingdom focused, love prioritizing way of living, and eventually suffering a brutal death for challenging the status quo. But then somehow, both quietly and triumphantly rising again, showing us that light conquers dark, darkness, that God's love knows no end. Jesus shows God's solidarity with us humans in our worst experiences, in injustice, in suffering, in voicelessness. In the feeding miracles, there's a clear invitation to a radical sharing, recognizing the gifts of the least amongst us. And when he's turning over the tables in the temple, we learn that it's okay to get angry about injustice. It's okay to challenge and to change situations that, that limit access to the, the oppressed, to the poor, to the people on the margin. My favorite of all is the, the washing of the feet. It, it's a, a beautiful story of kind of an invitation to, to see the world from a different perspective, to, to go to the place of the least, to be the one in the room that, that serves because you see the world differently, that you see this different perspective. We could go on and on, the, the Magnificat, the Beatitudes, there's, there's so much there, there's so many obvious calls. It's exciting, it's empowering, and it invites us to play a part in God's mission. And yet somehow we've kind of turned it into, let's be nice. Like it, my, my children in children's liturgy, you know, they're, they're sitting there coloring in their picture of Jesus and what, what's the lesson every week? We have to be kind. It, it's much more than that. The, the message is, is much more radical. And maybe I'm being a little bit unfair. I think that as Christians, we are really good at charity. I don't know if you're, that's your experience there, but in a Catholic school in the UK, you will find millions of fundraising activities, collections, outreach, kind of wonderful feeding programs, emergency provision, healthcare. Around the world, I think we are very, very good at charity. And that is beautiful and it is important. And we've got to keep doing it, but it's only half of the story. There's this charity thing and there's this justice thing. I would say that the charity bit is about the, the consequences. Yeah, it, it's the sticking plaster. It, it's the, the emergency hospital. All of this crucial. The justice stuff is looking at the causes. It's saying, well, what, why are these things happening? And that's part of the call as well. And you can find that through scripture. But the, the prayer at the end of Fratelli Tutti uh, that I particularly like, let me just get that one on screen. At the very last minute, I decided I'd go without my PowerPoint, but I'll get this one on screen because it's absolutely beautiful. Um, hopefully, you can now see that. Is that visible, someone that I can see? Nod? Yeah. So this is the prayer from Pope Francis at the end of Fratelli Tutti. Lord, Father of our human family, you created all human beings equal in dignity. Pour forth into our hearts a fraternal spirit and inspire in us a dream of renewed encounter, dialogue, justice, and peace. Move us to create healthier societies and a more dignified world, a world without hunger, poverty, violence, and war. May our hearts be open to all the peoples and nations of the earth. May we recognize the goodness and beauty that you've sown in each of us and thus forge bonds of unity, common projects, and shared dreams. Amen. In that prayer, you can spot the, these calls beyond charity, these calls to, to take this faith and make it something active. Um, in particular, I'd like to draw attention to, to this idea of encounter, to dialogue, uh, and to justice and peace. But it's there, the call to recognize the goodness in one another and in the other, whoever that is for us, and build shared dreams and projects. But on whose behalf? For whom are we are going to do these things? This, this is the, the question that came up again and again, and then Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis comes back to it. It's the who is my neighbor question. And we remember that Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, and we know the answer. Who, who is my neighbor? Well, it's everybody including and even especially those who are not like us. So the, the who is my neighbor? Um, let's see if I can get this PowerPoint moving, I'll give it a go. There we go. This is an activity I love to use with young people. Um, imagine a load of prayer stations and we have this as one of them. They have, they have a pen or multiple colors of pens and they have to fill in the gap. Love your neighbor. So it might be, they might write, love your elderly neighbor, love your unemployed neighbor, love your refugee neighbor. 
there's always one child who will write love your good looking neighbor or attractive neighbor or hot neighbor but that, that's not quite the message we're trying to get across the idea is that, that, that who is unable well it's everybody yeah and it's particularly those in greatest need pope francis makes clear that this this all goes even wider laudato si opens our eyes to to all of creation and there's a bit in fratelli tutti i particularly love uh, our daily efforts to expand our circle of friends, to reach those who, even though they are close to me, I do not naturally consider a part of my circle of interest. There's this focus on expanding who is my neighbor and being neighbors on purpose to the people around us. It's an active thing. Um, and who is my neighbor? Well, it, it's a, a great privilege of my job to connect to these Colombians around the world. So my neighbor is, is people in Myanmar currently suffering not just the impacts of climate change and a pandemic, but also a military coup. There's kids out of school for over a year now. Yeah, people in universities, they're just not having the opportunity. They're our neighbor. My people, my neighbors are in the Philippines. People like I, I get to connect to people whose families have died as part of typhoons. Yeah, because of the climate crisis, we have increasing uh, intensity and frequency of storms and people are dying. The neighbors in Fiji forced off their land, particularly significant for them because it's the land where their ancestors were. Being forced away from their livelihood, being taken away from by the sea up into, into the hills because of rising sea levels. Or my neighbors here in the UK trying to find safety but suffering due to fear and scapegoating. And clearly when I'm saying my neighbor, I don't mean my neighbor, it's our neighbors, yeah? Okay, so we're called to act and we know that we're called to be neighbors to all and indeed all of creation. And we're called to charity, but also charity and beyond. What does this look like? Well, Catholic social teaching gives us this wonderful model, See Judge Act, I'm sure you've heard this before. Um, and often you'll find See Judge Act and if you're feeling optimistic, celebrate, or see, judge, act, lament. That, that this is the cyclic thing that we, we go round and round and round, that we, we try to become neighbors on purpose to put love into action, not just something on a Valentine's card, but a kind of sacrificial love. Yeah, that's the example we're given in this, in this story of Jesus, in this, in this, this dangerous memory of Jesus. So seeing is becoming aware. Yeah, think back to the washing of the feet, seeing purposely, intentionally, making an effort to, to see those on the margins, to see the needs, to see injustice. I suppose in traditional language, what we're doing is we're informing our consciences. Judging, judging, I think is that it's a problematic word for some people because we get to this idea of being judgmental. Uh, it's not about, you know, oh, Wesley, your hair's really nice, or, you know, Wesley, your hair isn't really nice. It's not a judgmental thing in that sense. It's much more, I think, discerning. It's reflecting. It's prayerful. It, it's, it's taking the opportunity to, to see what we have seen through the eyes of the gospel. It's bringing those values. Remember all those values I gave you at the beginning around the Columbans? Bringing those values onto what we have seen. It's not being judgmental, a lovely quote from Dorothy Day. That we don't have the right to judge in that judgmental sense, but we are called to work out what it is that we're supposed to do. So for me, judging a lot of it is about working out what am I going to do and how am I going to do it? And one key thing to remember is that this is the mission of God. Thank goodness it's not any one of us that has to solve all of these problems. Yeah. And you can't do this on, a, on every issue. So it's working out well, what are the issues that, that make your heart beat faster or that make you cry or that make you angry or that working out discerning, what is it that you're called to do and on what issues? Um, and then we move to the action stuff. And, and I've said that we're good at charity. Look, there's a cake sale. Here we are kind of giving stuff out, work with the homeless. Um, but there's also actions that this is fascinating. So the, this is the Columbans and others in um, South Korea blockading a military base. If they can do that, what can we do? Does that make sense? So the, the, there's a call to go beyond charity and think, all right, well, here are a number of Catholic activists. Uh, well, not all Catholic, but, but this one in particular is Catholic. 
uh, blockading a, a, an arms fair in London. If people can do this, what can we do? So here, it's very easy to contact what we call our MPs, our, our elected representatives. Um, but it goes further than that. So you, here's, here's a young person writing about the, the, the refugee crisis and, and um, kind of making their point that, that what we have here, I don't know if you have similar, is a, a website called They Work For You, which allows us to kind of see how our MPs are voting and to, to kind of follow up as, as uh, Becca suggested, that it's more than just saying what we want to say to them and listening to their responses. It's also then seeing, well, what did they do? And then how do we feel about that? See Judge Jack's background, this cyclic thing. We're coming to the end of me. Um, I think just, just to kind of make the point, I suppose, that we are called to more than charity, that we are called to justice. The Columbans that I, that I work for, they challenge us, they encourage us, they, they, they show us a way of living out gospel values. If they can do that, what can I do? I'm called to put love into action, to be a neighbour on purpose. There's so much that I can do, but I think probably this prayer captures it best. So I might just leave you with that. Wesley, I'll pass back to you. Thank you, James. Um, I think the the distinction between the distinction and the complement complementarity between charity and justice is so important to what all of us do, uh, all the panelists as well as all of you here who are joining us, um, as we sort of as we work together to build a world of peace and justice. Because um, it's so often policy, government policies or corporate policies that are at the root cause of um, many of the injustices that you showed us, James, like homelessness and climate change. And policy is often the best solution um, to undoing some, a lot of those things. Um, so seeing our um, spirit, our sort of gospel invitation to care for all of God's creation as kind of one and the same as what we're doing here, I think is very important. Um, so we're gonna wrap up our panelist part of the night with talking very specifically about, well, how do we be a neighbor on purpose in this particular way? Um, how can we make love more than just a Valentine's Day message, um, but bring it into the offices of our elected representative? So I will hand it over uh, to Cynthia, who is going to walk us through um, that information. Cynthia. There we go. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, it works. Um, thank you, everybody, again, for joining us today. And um, thank you, uh, Rebecca and James, for your presentations and for your for sharing uh, your experience. And um, my part is going to be more hands-on, more tips on how you can also be doing this work, what James was saying, what Be Becca was saying, meeting with your representatives and bringing up to them uh, your issues, the issues that you care about. Um, so um, the first, I think the main uh, barrier that we see is that sometimes uh, we feel like we don't belong to politics. Um, we don't belong in politics. Um, that politics is something so complex, sometimes so, um, so divided that people faith, you know, do not have a voice. Um, but as uh, James was mentioning, I think our, so our faith uh, pushes to action, right? And that action is through charity, yes, but also through advocacy. So people of faith have a place um, in politics and politics is not, is not politicians. Politics is more than that. Um, so we like this quote from Pope Francis when he came and gave his uh, address to Congress, I think back in 2015. Um, and he said, you know, politics is an expression of uh, our complete need to leave us one 
in order to build as one of the greatest uh, common good and that out, out, out of, that out of a community which sacrifices particular interests in order to share injustice and peace is good, is interest, is social life, right? So politics, again, is um, what, what we were talking about earlier. How can we make, uh, make sure that uh, what we see in the world, this injustices, um, all of those needs, um, do not happen first in the first place. And if they're happening, how can we undo those? And how can we address those to poli through the, the policy work? So um, we belong in politics and politics is about community. So politics is about caring about the neighbor that Jameson mentioned, and caring about those who are oppressed, and even in our own communities, um, in other parts of the world. Um, there's just a lot happening right now, right? And we, as people of faith, as Catholics, we, we know that we have to care about others, our, our, our neighbors. So knowing that uh, we have a voice, we have a place in politics because we care about each other because politics is not, you know, about money influences, all of these things that we see in the media. Politics is about community. It's about caring about for each other. Um, and also another thing that sometimes is a barrier for anybody, uh, just a citizen or just somebody that is new, is that we think that politicians have power, are like these figures that we see on TV, on social media and stuff. Um, and also sometimes is this, these corporations with the monies and resources in that. But we have to acknowledge that politicians do not hold the power. The power is um, within our people, within our, our knowledge of what we see in the world, our voice, what we're called to do. So we also like this quote from uh, Bishop uh, Mark Seitz, who is the Bishop from El Paso, Diocese of El Paso, um, who, who says, uh, we should not fear power. Uh, power has has been given to us as uh, there was by, by our God who asked us to be co-creators in bringing about his reign. Um, but we must learn to use of power in new and creative and grace grace filled ways, uh, not reproducing the tactics and methods of domination division that belong to the oppressor. So we do we have power as well. And power is not necessarily um, bad in every situation right like our voice our again our knowledge in the case of the columbans their experience their first has first hand experience um, has power um and we are called to use again our voice and that power um to do more so all of us each of us um all of you who are attending this webinar today uh have power to do more to do change and to care for for our neighbors. Um, so now uh, I'm going to start talking more about what uh, what can we do? How can we start engaging with our elected officials? And why is it so important? Um, so there's this uh, study. Um, I, I'm sorry. Um, that was conducted. Um, in 2004, 2010, and the last one in 2015, studying about how uh, the, the level of engagement uh, from constituents to those, elect, those uh, offices. And um, they, this one specifically mentions that, so in-person visits from constituents have uh, some or a lot of influence in an undecided lawmaker. So as you can see, like um, those in-person visits have so much power in when sometimes uh, a decision is made, right? Um, having somebody that comes to their offices and talking and bringing up an issue uh, is going to matter more than reading about it or that, you know, somebody brought it up and it's not related to the people who the elected official serves, right? So, um, it's so important. Um, so it's a, it's a very, um, uh, you know, 
a very uh, important thing to, to keep in mind that our, um, our power to have those visits um, can make change. Then there's, there was this, that same study also find that nine out of 10, so 90 and 91% of congressional staffers who were surveyed said that it will be helpful to have information about the impact the, the specific bill or issue would have on the district or state. And uh, only 9% say, say that they receive that information frequently. Um, so what this means is that uh, although, you know, these offices are working on issues all the time, uh, people are not reaching out to them with information. Um, and that this information, as the previous uh, uh, data notes was saying, is very helpful. It could be very influential in the actual decision making from, from that elected official. Um, so then again, this same study said that similarly, 79% said that a personal story from a constituent related to a bill or issue will be helpful. And that um, only 8% say that they receive information frequently. So only 18% out of those staffers receive stories from their constituents, re receive those personal um, situations or anecdotes of what's happening in, in their district. So um, just connecting to what I was mentioned earlier, sometimes we feel like we don't have the power when in reality, uh, maybe those just those stories, what we see, what we experience in our daily basis with our neighbors can have already so much impact on the decision making. So again, so there's a gap. So with the, this, that survey, what was uh, helpful in, in realizing is that there is a gap. There is a need uh, of constituents who go and talk to, the, to their elected officials and who bring up also their stories, this personal experience that will have, again, uh, some influence in the decision-making. Um, so how can we solve that? Um, through lobbying, which is often a word that is intimidating or it has a certain stigma. But what lobbying is, is a relationship building. It's a relationship building in the long term um, of presenting your issue, that issue that you care about, uh, something that you see in your community, uh, uh, something that is close to you, and bringing it up to the office is not, it's meeting with them, but building that relationship and following up, right? How is this person? Uh, continuing to act and to both on, on, on the issue. Uh, how's, how are things moving? Bringing up um, stories, if you have more. Um, so how do we do that? Um, again, loving is about building uh, that relationship. And um, we asked um, what advocacy groups should do more of um, to build relationships with the office. And that survey said that 79% uh, of the staff survey said that meet or get to know the legislative assistant uh, within the jurisdiction or, 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 or over the issue area. And 62% said that meet or get to know the direct, direct state, uh, district state director. So that means that um, you can meet with the person from your district and start you know, building that relationship just so that they know you, they know the things that you care about, the issues that are bothering you is uh, a way place uh, a way place to start. So um, uh, how about um, continuing that relationship? So it's important to, like I was mentioning, holding those uh, elected officials accountable, um, telling them about what you care, what are the issues that you care about, what you are seeing, um, bringing those personal stories, those that local information, um the things of things that they may not know um sometimes they're in their offices and they might they think they know about an issue but they don't have the direct experience on the ground of what's happening right the, the facts um so your experience what you see has value um and we at the Center, Columban Center of Advocacy and Outreach, we developed this tool called the Advocacy Toolbox. And Wesley will share to the group uh, the link to that resource. Um, 
but we provide some tools, including uh, a guide of how to practice and create your story, right? Because again, sometimes it can be intimidating to go to this office and just share what's happening. You don't know how to how to do that. Um, so we give you some some tips uh, on how to present it. Uh, but again, just so just know that your story, what you see, already has a uh, great value. There are more ways to do lobbying than just than going in person. Of course, there's phone calls, there's letters, um, emails, postcards. I don't know who does postcards anymore, but some people do. Um, again, the visits to the district or the capital offices in DC, uh, letters to the editor through the local press, your newspapers, uh, social media, uh, um, just sending messages directly to representatives, tweeting about it. Um, um, one thing that is too good to remember is uh, that staffers sometimes, um, many of the times, record the interactions um, and then bring it up to their boss, to their, their director at the office. So if, for example, there's a a group of, of you and your neighbors, your friends who send an email of a specific, of a specific issue, they will record how many emails they get or they'll record how many phone calls they, they get on that issue. So again, sometimes we think we don't have the power, but we do, in, even in the small ways, right? There's, there's staffers do communicate what happens in their offices and what they receive through communication with their, their boss, their elected, the elected officials. Um, so now I'm uh, moving to the how um, to conduct like the in-person meetings, which again, sometimes can be intimidating, um, but with practice, uh, I think everybody can do it. So step-by-step, step, uh, going slowly through the process here. Um, step one is requesting an appointment, um, contacting the scheduler at each office usually has a person dedicating to schedule the meetings, um, either uh, your district office or uh, the, an office in Washington, DC. Um, try to get the appointment with the representative, if you can, um, or with the, the person most relevant to the issue. So let's say you're calling about immigration, you're talking about the refugee crisis or um, the migration crisis. So you will ask to schedule the meeting with the person who is assigned to that issue. Um, confirm the visit by phone or email a day before to make sure that you know, everything is, is still in place and to, re to remind the staff uh, that you are attending. I don't know what happened with my screen. There we go. Um, do your research. So the second is uh, find out a little bit about, about your issue, the issue that you're coming to, to present, what's in the news, what uh, were having the trends in previous years, in previous months. Um, and then practice your, your story. The most, I think the most uh, valuable tool that you have is that you're presenting your story. You're not an expert specifically, let's say on migration and trends and data, you're presenting your story, you're bringing your experience. So practice your story that again, we have some, a worksheet in that uh, advocacy toolbox that we have, the resource that we have, the uh, share, Wesley will share with you at the end of the presentation. Um, also research um, what is your rep's uh, position on the issue. That way you know already by hand, uh, ahead of your meeting if he's supporting your issue or if he's opposing it. And that can help you uh, draft like how the conversation will go, what are the questions that you're gonna bring or what are the asks that you're gonna bring. Think of questions and counter arguments that may come up and plan uh, possible responses. So let's, in, in the case, if he's opposing the issue, 
uh, think already of, of ways of how, how you can present your opinion, right? And how can you can counter uh, argument some of those um, um, statements or those positions. Again, all of this through that resource, we have some tools that will help you kind of write it so that way it's easier for you. Um, step three, three, make a plan for the visit. Um, decide what you will specifically ask your rep to do. So have an ask, like uh, Rebecca was saying earlier, like have an ask, what are, is, it, is it supporting a specific bill, um, vote on something uh, or, or oppose something. So have a specific ask. Uh, if you're meeting as a group, decide who will, who will, say, what, who will say what during the meeting. Um, and have a designated uh, spokesperson, a timekeeper, and uh, a speaker who, who will be sharing different things. Um, all of those the three the, the all of those three roles have uh, are important. Um, for example, timekeeper. Sometimes they only, those meetings they only give you like 30, 30 minutes. You need to keep track of time, right? Practice the visit. Uh, ahead of time with your group, run through the things that you're gonna say, um, prepare a short summary of your position and send it uh, a few days before your visit. Sometimes the office, the district's office already ask you for this. Like, can you, can you write a short paragraph of what you're coming to say, what's your position, why, you know, what are, basically why are you meeting with, why are you, why are you wanting to meet with the representative? So make sure to pre prepare that um, summary. Um, and fourth and last step is to the visit, introduce your group and express appreciation for the rep's work. If there's something that you found that they supported and that you like that they supported that, make sure that you, you say that. Um, share your personal and communal experience about the issue. We talked about that, personal stories. Um, ask for a specific action. Uh, so ask for you know, what are your asks? What is the thing that you want him, you want them to, uh, uh, to act on? Uh, if your rep supports your ask, ask them for what, for the ways that you or your group could support their work, right? We wanna make sure to keep moving uh, on the right direction. If your rep does not support your ask, ask them what it will be, what would take them to, to support the issue or bill. And that way it gives you some tools to maybe come, go back and, and, and do some more research or find some support um, to maybe, you know, help um, the rep to get to, to help the rep to get, uh, support you. Things to keep in mind during your visit. Um, again, so you're the, you're the expert. You're, so this doesn't mean that you are, you know, you are the expert on climate change or in the environment or in immigration, but you are an expert because you have a personal story. You have a personal connection with the issue. You know, because you have a neighbor who has experience in these things, you are affected directly because of X reason. So you are the expert in you when you in that meeting, you have to be empowered and feel like that you are the expert. Um, but so uh, if you can't answer a, a question, that you're asked, um, that's okay. You can you can uh, ask to you can let them know that you can go back and ask either your community or do some research um, on on the issue. And if there's any question and a particular question that, that maybe you can help um, bring more uh, information. Uh, find a common value. Stay stay on message and bring the conversation back to to your message if it goes off track. So make sure, that's why the summary and the preparation questions are helpful because it will help you know why you were there and to make sure that you get what um, out of the meeting, what you had planned to, to get out of the meeting, right? And of course, and with a thank you. And remember uh, that this is just the beginning of that relationship building. And the most important is the follow-up. So always after the meet, after the visit, follow up uh, with a thank you note, an email. Um, if there were questions, you can send the the answers to your question after you did some research, uh, and continue that relationship through social media, 
um, through attending the town, town halls and continuing to inviting, we're inviting them to a community event, an event that your group has. So that way it's again, it's about that developing that long-term relationship. So we do have that again, that advocacy toolbox that Wesley will share with you. And in this toolbox, we have like step-by-step -step guides that will go more in detail uh, as to the que questions uh, and that you can, that can help you guide your conversation and help prepare worksheets and other pro tips for the meeting. So uh, that ends my presentation. Um, the last thing that I will say is that the Columban uh, Center for Advocacy and Outreach is always available for any questions. Yeah, if, if you are preparing to, to start your own meeting, if you're not sure how to do it, we're also always helpful, available to help you to get on a call or provide direct you to a place or a resource so that you can feel more comfortable in doing it. Um, so yeah, thank you again for joining us today. Wesley. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, that was such a content rich presentation and I'm sure probably some of uh, all, some of our heads are swimming, just like trying to piece together all that information. Um, so just to reiterate, I put in the chat box um, a link to the Advocates Toolbox that Cynthia was mentioning, which has like all the information that you just heard um, in a handy dandy PDF. So you can go and download that um, and has worksheets as well that kind of walk you through um, researching and how to do the meeting. So that will be in the chat. Um, I'm gonna just uh, add a few more housekeeping notes and then invite folks if you have questions for any of our panelists to go ahead and put them in the Q&A chat box function. And once we get some questions rolling in, I'll pass them um, along to the appropriate person. Um, so just to say as well that in addition to the Advocates Toolbox, we do have um, a number of advocacy trainings that we are scheduling throughout the whole course of 2022. So while we don't have specific dates that we can share with you now, if uh, by virtue of um, participating in this webinar, you are signed up for our email list. So when we do have those dates, and if you wanna go deeper into the information that you learned here tonight, there will be opportunities to do that. Kind of like if this was Advocacy 101, you would be invited to Advocacy 201. Um, so do keep a lookout for that. Um, and then I get the second housekeeping is I know, um, you know, the pandemic has made coming to Washington DC physically very difficult, if not impossible for many people. Um, and so I do want to clarify and just say that all of what was shared, like all of what Cynthia shared in terms of um, the procedure for how you would set up a meeting and conduct it, all of that applies to Zoom meetings as well. And members of Congress are available over Zoom and are increasingly probably going to continue using Zoom even once travel becomes um, safer and more routine again, whenever that happens. Um, so in some ways, you know, even though the pandemic, you know, no one wishes it had happened, it has made in some ways Congress more accessible um, because you no longer have to literally come, you know, if you're far away from DC, literally come to the city to meet with your reps. Um, so just a note about um, kind of visits during the pandemic. Um, I, one question I want uh, to address um, to Becca or Cynthia or both of you um, is I know, so we had talked about um, meeting with members of Congress, like kind of the procedure and also talked a lot about, um, you know, you, we as constituents kind of um, hold the power in the relationship, right? Members of Congress want to hear from us, but inevitably we might live in a district with a member of Congress who is very against whatever our position is. Um, there are members of Congress that can hold, you know, very aggressive positions, maybe in the opposite direction from what we do, and meeting with them in some ways is even more challenging. So I'm just wondering, you know, if anyone um, on the webinar tonight or anyone that's going to watch this recording in the future has a member of Congress like that, like maybe they they don't acknowledge climate change exists, like what do you, how do you deal, I guess, with that member of Congress? I 
can jump in here if that's helpful. Um, that's a great question. And I think it, it also cuts both ways in terms of, um, you know, what if your member of Congress is the, has the polar opposite um, perspective on an issue that you do, or, you know, has had a really um, unfortunate voting record on a certain issue, anything like that. Um, but also what if you're meeting with a member of Congress that, you know, you're preaching to the choir, um, they're in lockstep with you, um, every, you know, what you want them to do, they already have done or are doing. Um, and so on the side of what if your member of Congress really disagrees with you, um, you know, there's, their history has shown that they're probably not going to be persuaded, et cetera. I would say a couple of things. Um, one is if you don't reach out to them, if you don't bring them that perspective or make that ask of what you want them to do, then it's sort of, uh, they can say that they're not hearing from their constituents on it. Um, at least when you are reaching out to them and raising it for them um, and making public that you've met with them, you know, taking a picture and putting it on social media, stuff like that, um, they can't say that they are only hearing one side of the position or one side of the issue, et cetera. Um, and then second, I think um, it's, it's up to your discretion um, in terms of, you know, Cynthia talked a lot about sharing your story. Um, you know, you, it's your story and you have agency to choose when and where you share that. Um, and maybe it makes sense to do a more public um, media push um, to get your legislator where you want them to be versus meeting with them. Maybe that hasn't gotten you very far. And so you wanna look at another strategy. Um, so I think, you know, looking at the advocates toolbox and looking at what other strategies are in there, if meeting with your member of Congress isn't getting you very far, um, there are other things that you can do. Um, and then the third one I would say is looking around to see, like getting to know your member of Congress and what, what messengers are particularly effective for them. Who do they listen to? You know, who really um, ha holds sway with them? And then this is sort of like next level advocacy, but talking to those folks, um, you know, building relationships with the messengers that your member of Congress listens to um, is another way to sort of get around that um, and get your position or your issue in front of your member of Congress. So those are spitballing some, some strategies that you can employ if that is your situation. Thank you, Becca. I, I think you, should, you did it perfectly. I would just, just add, I think that sometimes with those who oppose the, the power, again, the power of being repetitive here, but the power of your story and what is happening to you, right? Uh, in, in the meeting itself, is, um, people cannot, uh, cannot object to what's happening to you or what has happened to, to your neighbors. So that has power. Uh, they cannot say, you know, that's not true because it's your, is your version of the story. So I think that helps in the conversation. Um, and then of course, if just meeting with them doesn't work, then you can do other ways, uh, other types of advocacy, including you can start looking for groups that uh, in your area that care about the issue that have the same position that you do and start you know, work developing that. Again, if you're in a group, might be better than if you're by yourself, right? to start developing those relationships with your community and doing advocacy that way um, to advocate with your representative. Do you mind if I come in as well? Please do. Just, just three things come to mind. The first is do it anyway. Like, it, it's not always about the, the results. Sometimes it's about the action. I think that there's a, to, to make the, to make the effort, even if it's not going to work, is, is still important, then it might work. That's the next bit, I suppose, faith. But 
that we're trying to do this from a Christian perspective, that we, we believe in, in miracles, you know, we believe in the resurrection, we believe, we believe that things can happen. So to, to give God the opportunity to, to act through your action is, is important. And, and then finally, I mentioned Brian Gore in the Philippines. So he gave me this um, a brush, all right? So it's made up of loads of strands, like fonds of, uh, I think it's coconut. Um, and he used this, he would go around and do community organizing with this. And he'd go in and he'd say like, try and break one. And people could just break it easily. And then he'd say, right, try and break the whole brush. And it's impossible, it's just too strong. You can't, you can't break the thing. So obviously the thing is that we're stronger together. Like, get more people saying the same thing. Keep hammering at it, but hammer at it with, with a greater number. So do it anyway. Believe, pray, and, and let God work through it and, and bring others with you. Thank you, James. And thank you, Cynthia and Becca, as well, uh, for your answers to that question. Um, I wanted to ask a question specifically for you, James, although Becca and Cynthia, you're welcome to chime in. Um, I just wanted to get your, because so you had mentioned, um, you know, encounter is a big part of kind of what we are, like what we're doing here, both encountering, like making an encounter with our members of Congress, crossing that bridge, and then also trying to um, make a bridge between our members of Congress and the communities that we're members of. But I'm wondering, you know, you have a lot of experience connecting those bridges yourself, like you said, like between head teachers and refugees in the UK. And that process can be very intimidating, very kind of scary and sometimes um, soul wrenching. And so I'm wondering, um, like, how do you deal with those sort of that trepidation and kind of get over that hump? If that makes sense. Not sure if it's the answer to the question, but I'll, I'll answer another question. Um, I think the key thing, the key things are always the preparation and the follow up. And I, I was struck by by exactly Rebecca and, and Cynthia saying that on this call. So it's the same with these encounters. It, it's in in preparation, understand the context, prepare yourself to to kind of be open to hear the stories, to to share the stories, etc. And then it's in the reflection afterwards that the the learning comes out. You can have million encounters but if you don't stop and think about it if you don't stop and reflect if you don't create space for god to work through it if you don't stop and squeeze out the learning for yourself then the whole thing's a waste of time um and it's okay to be sad it's okay to be challenged it's okay for it to to make you angry it's okay all of that that's that's where the call comes from you'll find the call in that relational thing. Thank you, James. Uh, we have a question from one of our um, viewers from Gail who asks, what are um, good strategies to get in touch with members of Congress that are not in your state or district if you are part of um, like a national organization or part of a coalition and you want to share that perspective, um, but maybe you're not like a, a actual constituent of that, you know, district or state. Um, so our pro tips, I guess, from Cynthia and or Becca about maybe the best ways to go about that. I have an idea, but what, uh, Becca, if you want to add, one way is, of course, uh, trying to find if within your network of uh, collaborators or colleagues, there's somebody who lives in the district and uh, create a, a, a small form, a small group of one or two people in that district. And then you are, you're coming to with your issue with them. Because uh, sometimes there's offices that only, for, and that's in specific times, they only will hear from their constituents. So that's one way. I don't know if Becca, you have something else. Yeah, um, that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, it really is, it pays dividends and is really beneficial and, um, you know, true to the call of what we're trying to do here to, um, 
be speaking from the perspective of a constituent and from a um, community or group, you know, in that member of Congress's district or state. Um, I think so partnering with folks on the ground um, is really important and um, just logistically, um, you know, there are places you can find contact information for the offices of members of contact members of Congress that you want to contact. Um, so there's that end of it as well. And really, honestly, you can just pick up the phone sometimes and call either the state office or the DC office and say, hey, um, you know, I'm with X organization or whatever, and we'd like to meet with the person who covers this issue. Can you send me their contact information, et cetera? Um, people do that all the time. So logistically, that's another way um, to, to get in contact um, with them as well. Thank you both. Um, so I'm not seeing any more questions. So I'll do a last call. And then, um, so if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. And I will kind of wrap up our time um, by putting in the chat. So I just put in the chat the email address for the Columban Center. So as Cynthia mentioned, if you have questions about your particular advocacy work, um that you would like to share with us uh, and we can do our best to answer uh, feel free to reach out to us there um or if there are questions that you have like do you think of like the second you and get off this webinar and you're like oh darn um if only i thought of that sooner like well we're happy to answer them over email so please feel free to email us um and we will be sending this recording out in the next couple of days so keep an eye on your inbox um, so with that, I will thank all of you for coming, wish you the best of luck in whatever advocacy you are doing, and I will also thank our panelists um, for sharing their expertise, and especially to James, where it is late on the other side of the pond, so thank you for staying up with us. Um, yeah, so thank you, everyone, and we will see you at our next webinar.